Hello. Hi, how are you doing? Good and you? I'm good. Okay. Thank you again for agreeing to take me as one of your students. Oh yeah, no, of course. She says you're amazing. <laughs> That's very kind of her. Um, basically, I'm taking my MCAT August 7th. Um, my last NCAT, the breakdown was a 125 for Kempis. Unfortunately, a 120 for bio, which tanked my score, and then a 126 for cars, I think, and then a 126, I think, again for, uh... Wait, I'm sorry, can you, can you tell me those, uh, scores again? So... Let me make sure I got it right, 100%, but... It's 120 bio, biochem. And then it 120, 120 yeah. Uh, 120 BB. Mm -hmm. 125, um, Kempis. Mm-hmm. Um, so make sure I'm saying the rest right. I think it was 126 cars. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to go with 126 psych social. I just need to check and make sure that I'm, I have it. it right. But, yeah, uh... The bio, bio chem was what take my score. Um, I started, well, seriously studying because we had summer semester on July 12th, but I took a baseline MCAT about a month ago, and that was a 503, and then I took a, oh, my MCAT. Hmm? 503, and it was like a Kaplan one? Oh, no, it was AMCAS. Oh, uh, and AMC? Um, yeah. Which one was it? The first one. Got it. That's a pretty good score. Okay. And then the second one I just took recently is, um, it was a 502, and my cars was a 129. And wow. my AMCAT, I'm oh, sorry, my biochem was 125 on both this one and my original one. And mm -hmm. then my um, SEGSOCH and my... Kim Fizz dropped down two points from 126s to 124s. Got it. And that's because I spent a lot of time, like, you know, on bio, I guess. I don't know. But I just know that I need to, I want at least, you know, to get above that 500 benchmark, but I know I can at least get, like, maybe, hmm, I don't know. I mean, of <laughs> course, I'm 24, 510, but, you know, getting higher than that would be, I mean, getting higher than a 50 freaking three would be amazing, in my opinion. Just with the rate that things have been going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like uh, that car score is really, really good. Uh, yes, I started because I was talking what, to... What was your major? Hmm? What was your major? Oh, chemistry and oh, science. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. It does? Oh, like, wow. yeah, physical science majors do really well on this test. And mm. it made sense that... Uh, Okay, you said chemistry and neuroscience was my minor. Okay, so oh, I missed cool. my um, psych social on my first MCAT. So I took I mean, my MCAT last year was a one twenty seven out of one twenty six. So like, basically, uh, bio took me down. And honestly, I was a BS major, so yeah. I heavy in chemistry, and I didn't have a lot of bio classes. So yeah. By the time my senior year, I took all the bio classes I need for the yeah. cat, and it's not a name. <laughs> I could mm -hmm. use this on the exam. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's see. It seems like you're able to catch up on BB pretty quickly to get that 125. So, uh, yeah, so what would you like to do? Do you want to go over, like, problems? Do you want to... Uh, uh, oh, yeah, and wh when are you taking your test? August 7th. Got it. Yes, and so the biggest concern, of course, is keeping my BB up. And actually, mm -hmm. I would want to get it higher because, like, I don't know, I don't know. I think my biggest thing when it comes to BB is passages. My um, free response questions are always good. Like, it's always never been a problem because it's... I Wait, free response good. questions? I'm sorry, like, no non-passage questions? Oh, oh, yeah, discreet? Oh. Yeah, discreet. Mm -hmm. Um. They're always like, I might miss one or two in an exam because those are just like pure memorization, which is my strength. Mm -hmm. But passages sometimes really are, can be hit or miss for me. It depends on how it's depicted and portrayed. 
Yeah, it seems like uh, it seems like your your car score kind of shows that you're pretty good at passages, actually. Um, yeah, with uh, the other sections, I usually say that you know with, with the sections that aren't cars to uh, and look at the questions first and look in the passage for what you need to look for um, based okay. on answering that question. Because well, can I record this so I, I can go back um, when we go oh, over? Oh yeah, so yeah, I'm recording it and I'm going to put it on uh, the YouTube channel and you can see it there. Okay. But you can, you know, record it, you know, as Oh, well. it's just the host has to give me permission. Um, let's see. I don't even know how to, wait. Um. Yeah, I, I don't even know how to do that. How to, how to let... It's okay. I'll look at it on YouTube. Got it. Okay. So. Um. Okay. So you're you're saying like passages on BB are pretty hard to decipher. That's usually the case because they there's just kind of like a mess mm -hmm. um we can start working on like some some like passages that you've done that you may have questions okay. on um yes I usually just... that's like the approach i take um just mm -hmm. like attack the passages or attack the questions like like straight up and we mm -hmm. can like talk about things like along the way okay so I'll start with these because I have some past questions and then some regular questions. Mm -hmm. I'm going to then screen share. Yep. Okay. So this was one. These were Kaplan. And I saw that you said you don't like Kaplan. But, like, I don't oh, yeah. use all my AAMC ones until next week because I do have about two and a half more weeks. So I'm kind of having to use QBanks um, mm -hmm. for Kaplan practice right now. And why don't you like Kaplan? Is it because, like, what's – I mean, I don't like Kaplan <laughs> Uh, it's just that the the they they test a lot of minutia things that are are usually mm -hmm. not really it's not ju it's just not as representative of what you're actually going to get on or see on the MCAT compared okay. to let's say next step which is called blueprint now or mm -hmm. Altius or U World those three are really are really good in terms of uh, the material that they give you. But since, you know, you, you it's part of your program that you have to use uh, Kaplan, it might as well, you know, use it, right? I'm assuming you don't like Princeton, then. Um, I haven't really, really used them or anything like that, but, uh, why? Uh, is there any, any stuff? I have there? access to Princeton material. Yeah, yeah, I'd be open to, to using basically anything. It's just that I haven't <laughs> used it myself, so... Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, what is this? Bit, it, sound, it looks like Bitcoin, <laughs> Bicoid. So uh, let's see. So I would look at the, you know, the question first. So let's see. Oh, it's a screenshot. Cool. So, uh, different transcription factors in fruit fly embryos based on the information in the passage, which one is most likely to be Bitcoin. Okay. So it seems like it makes the head and thorax. And, all right, so first of all, like, I would take a look at, like, the graph, and generally it seems like that dark black line, that A or whatever, just, like, drops precipitously, and then the one that goes up in the middle seems to be, like, the opposite of it. Mm -hmm. It seems to be the opposite of what, like, that, what A is doing and then what B is doing. Mm -hmm. um, wow, I can't even... I can zoom in. Oh, no, no, it's okay. I, I zoomed. Um, I, I was just trying to see, like, the difference between C and D. D, mm -hmm. I, D is that one with that hump in the middle, right? Uh, and yes. And C is that one that's just going, like, slightly down? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. So, what is this? Oh, anterior, posterior, concentration of... Okay, so, anterior, posterior, gradients... Um, all right, so if it makes the head 
and thorax, which is like the midsection. Mm -hmm. That seems to be like the anterior end of the of the organism, right? Yeah, I get. It. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it should be there should be more of that transcription factor towards the anterior part, right? Mm -hmm. Is that like okay? What made you uh, choose choose B? Because uh, I had no clue what he was talking about. So I just guess. Oh oh, um, so like, well you know, well the way that I was just describing it just now, does that make sense? It says the graph below illustrates the relative amounts of four different transcription factors in the embryo and from my understanding transcription factors that deals with dna correct oh got it so so basically a transcription factor is the thing that attaches to dna starting mm -hmm. transcription right so it causes okay and then based on the information of passage which one is most likely bitcoin and so bitcoin Oh, okay. So I see what you're saying. That like Bitcoin is a transcription factor that's for the head and thorax, and you're saying that would be most anterior, and so it should be a. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so it was more of like literally reading from it. Literally, yeah, the graph was just really weird for me, so I was like, okay. Oh yeah. So basically, like yeah, I would like take a second to just notice like what's happening in the graph. Like I see a. Okay is very much expressed uh, the concentration is very high and towards the anterior end mm -hmm. and then uh b concentration is very high towards the posterior end uh d concentration is high in the midsection mm -hmm. and then c it's pretty it's relatively constant because it's you know relative to the other types of curves which are going up and down like really you know significantly and mm -hmm. then i would basically look then they say they ask which one would be you know the bitcoin thing so then i look for that word and you know i see it in the beginning and then i see that it gives rise to the head and the thorax and you know i go from there okay that makes sense that makes sense so like i didn't look at like you know the other stuff yet okay i'm pretty bad with genetics <laughs> oh yeah I'm used to just depending on Punnett squares, but then things get a little wonky when they talked about like, oh, it's um, X length or Y length, and then like. Oh yeah, on. yeah. Because Punnett squares, like they're you know they're invented by Mendel, like I think in mm -hmm. the 1600s, like mm -hmm. way before people knew like anything about DNA or inheritance, mm -hmm. and um, and we're learning more and more about that stuff like each day with epigenetics and stuff. Like, do you, mm -hmm. have you heard about epigenetics? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so, yeah. Um, you have, like, yeah. things that, when it comes to, like, just ca uh, calculating um, certain genetic uh, inheritance things? Yeah. So, so like, for instance, right, um, what we used to think was, like, that you get half of your genes from your mom, half of your genes from your dad. Mm -hmm. I mean, that makes sense, like, not just in terms of, like, Punnett squares and, you know, Mendel's version of heredit heredity, but um, it also makes sense in terms of, like, chromosomes, because you do get 23 from your mom and 23 from your dad. Right. But the thing is that DNA does not dictate what gene gets expressed. Like, we know that now, because certain genes could be expressed and certain genes can be not expressed so like epigenetics mm -hmm. is like kind of like dna can be like acetylated which means that well you know what that is because you're a chem major yeah. but it basically means that the dna gets o opens right. up and gets ex like exposed more for mm -hmm. a transcription factor to bind to it and cause it to be expressed and if it's mm -hmm. methylated it'll close up and condense more Mm -hmm. which means that a transcription factor isn't going to attach to it. So mm -hmm. we used to think it's like, oh, like, you know, let's say cancer runs in your family. So if you have a gene for it, then you'll get cancer. But now we know that different 
things in the environment, different things all over can affect whether that gene is expressed or not. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, but um, with these, when it comes to more pr percentages and stuff, I oh, guess like I know oh, there's a way to calculate. Let's see. So, sorry, I haven't seen this. So let's see. If generation two Drosophila from experiment two, so they're talking about experiment two, so I'm going to have to look at it, um, are made at what percent? Oh, yeah. I'm going to have to go to the actual thing. Oh, to like scroll down and stuff? Yeah. Can you still see it though, or no? Uh, no. That's fine. I'm going to cast them right now. Mm hmm. Because I know, like, uh, some things you kind of can do Punnett square, but then other things you have to do, like, actual math. Mm -hmm. And then I also get confused when it starts to talk about um, different types of inheritance, like mm -hmm. X and Y, and the autosomal, and this, that, there, and so, like. Yeah, these. so what's an autosomal mutation? Or what's an mm, autosome? All right, so an autosome is basically any chromosome that isn't a sex chromosome. Okay. So, and then if something is sex linked, then it's on the sex chromosome. So, okay, hold on. The graph illustrates. Okay, here it is. So you're saying. Okay, so you're saying that. Um, can you see this? Oh yeah. All right. So let's see. Experiment two. So they mated a male that's hom hom homozygous for wild type, with a female that is homo. Wait, females that are homozygous for the mutant recessive allele. Okay. So all right. The resulting offspring are denoted gen generation two. Are they used? Okay, so some other stuff. Wait, sorry, okay. So the mutant one produces non-functional B, C, D. Okay. All right, so basically if we take the generation two, so it seems like, all right, so this is like a Punnett square thing, but Okay. It, it's going to be homozygous for wild type and homozygous for the mutant. So all of the organisms mate or whatever. Generation two is just going to be heterozygous. Zygous. Okay. And then they're saying if they mate people like the flies from generation two. Mm hmm. So you're, we're going to mate heterozygous like genotypes together. Mm. What percent will be wild type? So it's mm, so it's homozygous with the homozygous resulting in heterozygous, and then you're you're mating a heterozygous with wild type, but oh, like uh, with another heterozygous. So like ex um, generation two, they're going to be heterozygous, and then they're mated for, with each other. So each other. does it say like up top if it's dominant or wait wait oh sorry no it says right here recessive my bad so the mutant one is recessive right mm -hmm. okay this is so wild type activity would that be capital A because if so then that makes sense on the Punnett square just true yeah yeah. Okay, so wild type is capital A, and then the mutation, okay. Okay, so that is 75%. Um, okay. Now, if we weren't, so there's sometimes it gets really complicated with phenotypes, and, like, the Punnett squares have to be huge unless you do math. Do you know, like, what type of math? When you say like, phenotype, do you mean, like, a dihybrid cross or something? It says, like, I have to find a specific question, but sometimes they're like, oh, it's like capital, capital A, two capital A's and, like, two lowercase A's, and it's matched with someone who's, like... Yeah, got it. Okay. So that's, like, a dihybrid cross. 
Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, those those can get pretty annoying. There's, like, a foil method of doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, you could also, or I could also, like, tell you, like, what the ratios would be. Um, it's, like, for, for genotypes, it'll be 9, 3, 3, and 1, I believe. And what does this mean? All right, so that means, I think that means that nine of them will exhibit, I think, like, dom or the dominant homozygous, and three of them will exhibit, like, the heterozygous, Mm -hmm. like, genotype, maybe, like, capital A and little a. Then Mm -hmm. the next three would be, I think, little a and capital A, and then the, the one, I think, is going to be homozygous recessive. And this goes for all dihybrid crosses? Yeah. Let me make sure. And, okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. It's the phenotypic ratio, not the genotypic ratio. Phenotype ratio. Yeah, 9, 3, 3, 1. And this is one where it's like, oh, for brown eyes, it's capital B, capital B, lowercase, lowercase. And then black eyes, it's some other letters and they want you to find out what color the child's eyes would be yep you would do okay okay yeah mm-hmm. so that's the that's called a dihybrid cross so you know if like round if it's like a p or something and it's round it's whatever r capital r or something and then mm-hmm. you know yeah it's a dihybrid cross okay and then you said for mutations sex link is on the sex gene and you said autosomal is on any other oh when it, it said it's it's on a chromosome a sex chromosome chromosome like the you know the one in like a karyotype that is like the 23rd one on a karyotype so basically mm-hmm. the one that can be a double x or an xy mm-hmm. yeah and autosomal um, is everything else so with that those can be inherited it too autosomal ones yeah yeah Okay. Well, everything else. Is it sometimes is is a specific type of mutation that's like you can't inherit because it was just a random mutation in the individual? Mm-hmm. That's like what it. That's called is it a germ or? Wait. Oh, like a well. Oh, just I mean, like there could there could always be mutations like that that happen like spontaneously that it, uh-huh. are not like from like a parent okay I gotta find a name. but those those would basically be like you know not non-hereditary kind of okay. like a random mutation um this one i just had to so this one it says yeah i had to multiply it by three i'm assuming yeah so i can mess that one up um i'm trying to go back to the screenshots kind of laser specific you could probably use like the arrows yeah okay yeah you did that all right so yes Mm -hmm. this didn't make sense to me because i read this and it said when the concentration of ca is low pth is synthesized and released okay that's fine and then down here it says somewhere that um what does it say PTH increases renal tubular CA reabsorption. So I thought, okay, low PA, low CA, PTH, um, you get more CA. So why is, but it says it's negative. And I'm like, it mm-hmm. didn't say. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So basically PTH stimulates osteoclasts. And. Yes. In of bones, right? Yeah. Wait, uh, what was the, what was the other thing you said? Creation is osteoclasts. Oh, so that'll be the osteoblasts. Okay, osteoblast is creation. Yeah. So, basically, like, the way I would write the note is basically, like, calcium ion, you know, with the brackets, Mm -hmm. and then a subscript that says, um, blood, and then an arrow going forward, and then, you know, the same calcium 2 plus in brackets with a subscript that says bone. 
Oh, sorry, sorry. That would be for osteoblasts. Osteoclasts would be the other way around. So calcium from the bone going to calcium in the blood. Calcium from the bone into the blood is osteoclast. Yep. Yeah, because you're tearing down the bone, so you're going to have more uh, increased of CA2+. Plus. Mm -hmm. In the blood, yeah. And then creation of bone, calcium of the blood going into bone. Okay, so here, hmm, it says, okay, it says PTH first it stimulates activity of bone cells known as osteoclast. So, yes, so you're right. Osteoclast is deterioration of bone, and so you get an increase of CA in the blood. I still don't understand why it's negative feedback. Oh, because it stops itself? Because it's going to, so a low concentration of, of calcium ion in the blood will stimulate the production of something that will create more calcium in the blood. Mm -hmm. As it got, gets, you know, until it goes to baseline, and then it's going to stop doing that. Because if it was positive feedback, it's mm -hmm. just going to be a reinforcing loop. And we're going to have no more bone left. Okay. So, so it, like, this type of thing, it's always going to be negative feedback. Okay. Like, if the example was a high CA2 plus concentration stimulates the produ production and release of calcitonin which is the, the other hormone, mm -hmm. that will also be negative feedback because yeah, it's just good. going to do it until it reaches, until it reaches a baseline level of mm -hmm. concentration of, of calcium in the blood. And as it reaches that baseline, it's going to tell, you know, it's going to have a negative feedback loop telling the body to make less of it. Mm. If it was a, so yeah. So, I should just assume, hmm, what are examples of a positive feedback loop then? Or are those not really common in the body? Um, I'm trying to think of one in the body, but for instance, but what... The passage, like, it didn't really say, I mean, where specifically in the passage does it say, like, oh, it, it gives hint that it's negative feedback? Um, well, uh, alright, so let's see. It seems like... Um, all right, so on the, at the bottom of the second paragraph, it says, thus, if there is an increase in extracellular concentration of phosphate ion, um, extracellular um, calcium will deposit on bone, resulting in lower... All right, well, actually, that doesn't necessarily say it, but let's see. Oh, okay. It tells you that at the end of the first paragraph. When okay. plasma concentration of calcium is high... Calcium binds to receptors in the parathyroid, oh, okay. inhibiting. Mm -hmm. And I freaking highlighted it. It was right there. Yeah, but you should just you know know that in general. That's yeah. like the way mostly every kind of feedback loop works in our body. Um. So, I uh, maybe there's uh like a dis maybe a disease can cause like a positive feedback loop. Okay. Because. Yeah, generally speaking, like, yeah, it would be one that would reinforce itself and not have any type of, like, homeostasis. Like, I, the, the, the first thing I think of is, like, the way that I approach, like, studying is, like, if I get a certain number of hours of studying done, then I get mm -hmm. to have fun. And so... <laughs> And then if I have fun, then I have to, like, study. So it, that's kind of, like, my own personal, like, you know, positive feedback loop. Right. In psychology, that's called positive reinforcement. Yes, which I also want to hit on. Mm -hmm. um, this one, I was oh, for a little late. All right, so what percentage of the entire gene for CFTR specifies the amino acid sequence of the final 
CFTR. Okay, so I'm going to look for numbers. So I see the gene is 190, 189 kilobases long. And the protein is a single polypeptide that's 1480 amino acids. So you... divide that by... 189. Yep. And you see the protein is where? Oh, right after? 1480? Okay. So I would take, you know, 100, 189 and I would write... And the uh, scientific notation, I would like to write a capital E and then the exponent. So I don't have okay. to write times 10 to the, you know power so i would write like 189 e3 uh -huh. and you know i would divide it by three first oh just to make it smaller yeah because three uh code uh a codon is uh three nucleotides so 60, wait what say that again oh the uh, like a co so like three nucleotides um yes. code for oh. an amino acid yeah so I divide it by three, so I'd get um, 63,000. E, e to the three, right? Oh yeah, yeah. So 63 E3. Okay. Um, three is just like a regular number, not a subscript or, or superscript. Um, so yeah, what is it? What did I say? Yeah, 63 and then uh, 63 E3. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, Oh yeah, and then I would, uh, I suppose, divide it by the fourteen eighty. So. Oh no. Why I would put four. Just, yeah, sorry. Why wouldn't you just divide it by the fourteen eighty like initially? Oh, just because, uh, the gene is talking about that many base pairs, like that many bases. And three bases. Are in, in yeah. It's almost like you're doing dimensional analysis. It's like. 189 e3 bases times um like whatever like i would write down like basically like one amino acid per or like divided by three bases okay so this that's the right, conversion this factor e3. so okay 189 e3 is how many bases i have mm-hmm and then oh sorry so that's just so let's see um here i'll write this down but uh basically what i did you can if you want to think of it in terms of like dimensional analysis like like i would take that 189 e3 bases i would yeah, multiply it by one amino acid over three bases and then the bases cancel Okay. So and then what you am I... get. Mm -hmm. So I go okay. I have 189 e three bases, mm -hmm. and then I'm trying to get it to amino acids by dividing it by three. Okay, what is the question specifically asking for? Oh, what percentage of that of that gene In is codes? for the amino acid? I mean, I'm sorry, it's for the it's for the protein. So what percentage of this gene encodes for the protein. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now this makes it. Okay, so I have 189 E3 bases, and then I multiply it by one amino acid per three bases. Yep. And then the bases cancel out, and then I have, um, I guess 1,480 amino acids. Acids code for this protein. Uh, wait, when you divide it by three, you, uh, wait, are you saying the 1480 part? Yeah. Is it 1480 amino acids code for this protein? Oh, uh, so that'll be the total amount of amino acids. So then since you have your answer in, um, amino acids. Oh, you can, okay. Yeah. So I would do here, I'm going to write it out. So then it will be, so we have 63 E to the three. And so are we doing uh, one, so it basically will be 1400 divided by 63 E3. If you're trying to get a percentage of it, right? No? Uh, you could do, all right. So I get 63 E3 amino acids. Like that's mm -hmm. how much uh, it would be if, if each base 
was involved in making a an uh, making you know and mm -hmm. i would uh take the 1480 mm -hmm. and divide it by the 63 e3 mm -hmm. cause then that's part over a whole okay and then you just okay well 63 e3 would be like what, 63,000, right so It'll be like 148 over 6300. Would you want to do like 1.5? Uh, what is that? P to the negative 2 over 1, 2, 3, 6 point 3, P to the negative 3, maybe? And then get like I don't know no math. I'm down to one point five e to negative two over six point three e to negative three. And then my math gets wonky because I'm not really good with math. Oh yeah. I basically made the fourteen eighty fifteen e two. And I made the sixty three like a sixty. And then five goes into uh the fifteen basically uh, three times goes into the 63 like so 1480 turns into 1500 and then 6300 turns in 63,000 turns into what now oh uh you can i i made that like turn into uh 60 but maybe i should have done 64 uh -huh. i'm gonna do 64. 64 i mean i'm sorry 65 my bad 65 65,000 and so then it turns into 15e2 over 65e3 um okay um, it's like actually four like oh you know e i i should have just I should have just left it at 1480 because 7 goes into the 14. Uh, okay. I have no clue. <laughs> so keep it 1480 and 63? Yeah, I'm going to do that. Okay. Alright, I get basically, uh, let's see. So fourteen. I'm just gonna do fourteen sixty three. It's like fourteen times oh, fourteen e two e two sixty three e three. Okay, and then seven for both of those is two over nine, which equals mm, about three. Four and a half. 4.5 e to the one. It's a negative one. So it'll be like 0.45, which is not the answer. <laughs> oh, I know. No. I have no clue. Hold on. Because so 2% is 0 0.02. That's 0 0.03. It's bigger than both of them. I get like I get like two point two ish. Okay, how I I got four point five. Um, let's see. I did. Like four five. Sorry. So I did. Uh, all right. So I did like fourteen, e two, divided by sixty three e three. Yes. And seven goes yeah. into the fourteen twice. Seven goes mm -hmm. into the sixty three nine times. Right. And then 2 over 9 is uh, 0. 0.22. Oh, okay. How do you how do you do that math? Oh, yeah. So there's something. Uh, I'll, sh I'll make a OneNote notebook for you like I, I did for um, all my other students. But there's like certain things that certain math things that I want you to memorize to make help make the math easier. Some of them involve like fractions. Okay. So like one over nine is equal to zero point one one. Okay. 
over 9 is equal to 0 0.11. Yeah, okay. so then 2 over 9 is just 2 times 0.11. Oh, which would be 0 0.22. Yeah, and sometimes, like, you know, when I get that number, I don't have to really, like, I kind of, like, stop doing the exponent part just because it kind of it kind of gives me an idea. Like, I get something basically a little, little bit larger than 2. Yeah, it, it fits into this because you have to, it's 0.22E1, which is essentially 0 0.022, which is in between 2% mm -hmm. and 3%. Yeah. Okay. okay, so that drawing will help me because I'm, my math, and which you'll see when we go over chem phys is kind of hindrance for me when it comes to physics and gender chem. Um, this yeah. One. So d did it help by explaining it? Because, you know, you majored in chem to explain it, it as, like, yeah. dimensional analysis. Once I, like, know what I'm trying to get to, that makes sense. Because I know that, like, three amino acids are for each codon. I just didn't know, like, because they threw a couple numbers at me. They threw 189, 1480, 1500, you know, 508. And I oh, was, like, I didn't even look at those. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, but 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 when I did see the question asking about percentage, I did look for numbers. So. But I guess I just stopped there because I knew that's all I needed. What percentage of the entire gene? So when I see questions like this, look for the length of the entire gene, mm -hmm. and then turn that into amino acids, and then compare it, ratio ratio it to like the actual region that goes for a specific. Yeah, like I, I wrote like, you know, yeah, I, so instead of just saying like divided by three, I mm. wrote like 189 E3 bases, and then, you know, in parentheses, one AA over three bases, so then the bases cancel, and then you have, you know, that many amino acids, which is the theoretical amount if every single, you know, base was a coding, or, you know, yeah. Okay. And, and, you know, you're going to see that in most cases, like most of the gene of a gene is not translated. Right. Yes. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, you know, the rest of it is just like making the numbers work, making them fit. Yeah. Like when I made the 1500, I didn't think about like seven being able to go into the 14. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. All right, so now I'm going to look for that. So there's, okay, that's a common one. That's 90% of all of whatever CF, cystic fibrosis cases. Okay, so apparently, okay, so what does it do? It says during translation, that mutation results in the deletion of this phenylalanine residue at that position. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much it. what happens. It deletes, it deletes this amino acid. So it, it, you know, it's going, okay. So how is that going to affect, oh, like which thing it, will it affect? Mm -hmm. Okay, so okay. it's definitely going to affect primary structure because primary yeah. structure is just the sequence of amino acids. Mm -hmm. And well, honestly, if it affects, I'm trying to see if this statement is true. If it affects primary structure, it should affect, okay, all right, not necessarily true. So I was going to say primary structure, if it, if, there, if it affects that, it's going to affect all the other types, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, mm -hmm. but that wouldn't be the case if you just replaced it with something that is similar. Right. So... Phenylalanine, you know, it takes up a lot of space. Like, let's say, like, it's supposed to be, like, alanine, and you replace it with something that's similarly, like, sized. Maybe it won't affect, like, secondary and tertiary structure and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. since we're not replacing it with something that's similarly sized or has similar properties, we're completely deleting it, then it should affect everything. Um... But, so, like, secondary structure, that's, like, alpha, heli alpha helices, um, beta pleated sheets. 
if we go over, so just to clarify, mm-hmm. what step what stabilizes the primary structure is okay. So okay, primary structure involves just peptide bonding, yep. and then secondary structure is stabilized by the hydrogen bonding. Yeah, uh, usually, between, but, yeah. What? Oh, the amino amino term and the C term. Oh, usually between like a like an like a OH groups and could be like OH groups in the um, side chains and like the carbonyl groups. In... See, I thought the side chains came into play in the tertiary structure. I get confused between the secondary, like, because sometimes I see, oh, secondary structure is stabilized by hydrogen bonding amongst, that's what I've been taught a lot, is amongst the chain, amongst the amino acids themselves. You know, I didn't know if that, like, because I know quaternary means that it's getting, it's bonding with other things outside of itself. And tertiary, it's holding amongst itself due to the side chains. So then, secondary... so I think what you said for tertiary is what it is for secondary, because like alpha helis helices and beta pleated sheets, like you know the pro mm-hmm. the proline turns. Mm-hmm. So if proline is one of the uh, side chains, it's going to cause a turn in that beta pleated sheet. Mm-hmm. So. So yeah, secondary structure will be between, you know, like the, the side chain and the carbonyl carbon and stuff. So that's where it start. it's going to start to, to turn into those types of shapes. Tertiary structure will be like a th- kind of like more three-dimensional kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Not particularly between one amino acid and, and another, but overall shapes. And... If the protein has subunits, then quad- quaternary structure can exist, which means that there will be interaction between the subunits. Okay. Okay. So, secondary, it is... I just have to look over that again. It's, sometimes information can be conflicting, but the biggest... <laughs> oh yeah, so that's like, that's kind of like what, so like, like when I take like my notes and stuff, I look at like, I look at like different books, uh, textbooks, and different mm-hmm. like information, and I consolidate them in my notes. Um, mm-hmm. I have some really good textbooks that I use, mm-hmm. uh, so, so, and, and also like I could just add it to your to your, to your one note because I have it like in front of me like mm-hmm. primary structure is the amino acid backbone mm-hmm. and which are you know dipeptide bonds and disulfide bonds and that mm-hmm. determines how a protein will fold mm-hmm. and the secondary structure is the spatial arrangement of amino acids near one another so it's amongst the same protein or is it now with other oh oh it's in the same it's in the same uh same one so yeah so like since the secondary structure involves hydrogen bonds you're Mm -hmm. also going to have like you're basically like what you said about the side chains Mm -hmm. like that's still going to be like true because uh in in terms of like you don't need like a side chain to be like anything because you're still going to have hydrogen bonding between the amine groups and the uh, carbonyl oxygens. So this is hydrogen bonding amongst amine and carbon. Yeah. Among, yeah. Within the backbone. So like, uh, Uh yeah. So what you said about the side chains, not really interacting, like it's true. Okay. But in terms of phase where they come into play side chain interactions. Yeah. But if the side chain is proline, then yeah. that's going to, you know, cause like a kink in the secondary. Yeah, they're alpha, they're alpha and beta breakers, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, and, and then, then the quaternary is the tertiary uh, structure is the three dimensional arrangement. Mm-hmm. And it's just one subunit. Okay. So that can be like you know. Uh, like like a sarin next to another sarin or like a disulfide bond between two cysteines or um like aspartic acid and arginine 
because one is like negatively charged, one is like positively charged. Mm -hmm. So that that's going to involve some uh, side chain activity. Okay. Yeah. So what you said about the secondary structure is true, but remember about the proline turns. Okay. Yes. 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 I know they do mess stuff up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because okay. because in proline the side chain is bound to its own amine amino like amine terminal mm -hmm. so what's normally going to be a primary amine becomes a secondary amine say that again so so uh in every other amino acid you have a primary amine right an amine group that's just it's not bound to anything else so mm -hmm. it's primary mm -hmm. and but in proline the side chain is bound to its amine group. Yes. So mm -hmm. that amine is a secondary amine. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And quaternary structure are the association between different subunits. Okay. Like, and it only exists if there are more than one subunit. Okay. So this one, I don't know if it tells you. Uh, Why does it not? Yep. Uh, affect quaternary then is that I mean because like like you said like if you are messing up primary I mean oh so that like for quaternary structure to change there has to exist more than one subunit okay oh so more than one subunit has to be affected oh more than one subunit has to exist exist so, so when we yeah. talk about this delta F 580 it's just for one subunit uh, yeah, so that's what I was trying to look for. I was trying to look for if they gave you any information about whether this has more than one subunit or not. So the position doesn't refer to subunit, it's just... Wait, I'm sorry, what what, what about position? This is, this is, I'm assuming that it doesn't affect quaternary because it's just affecting it at one position, in turn maybe just affecting less, one subunit instead of like being across the whole... Like oh, gonna... so basically, uh, basically, I'm going to look for like it, it. So whether or not there are subunits, mm -hmm. so I see maybe some hints which are like, it says that it's a single polypeptide. Maybe yeah. that can be a hint. That means that there's not there's no more than one subunit. Okay. Uh, let's see. So, all right. So. This thing makes a transmembrane uh, channel, I suppose. So, yeah, I mean, all right. Can't, it, does he, let's look at the explanation. I wonder if they give you any indication other than single polypeptide. Okay. Yeah, single polypeptide. Uh, Therefore, okay. it doesn't have subunits, and thus quaternary structure won't change. So will it say, if it has more subunits, will it say multi-polypeptide? Like, what vocabulary? Oh, they, they'll probably mention, like, the subunits it's composed of, like, like alpha subunit beta subunit or they'll say like it's a tetra tetra um like homo tetra something if it's like four different things Alpha, that are the same beta, gamma, whatever subunits yeah or they'll they'll say like like homo or hetero if they mean if it's like the same type like a okay. homo dimer or whatever that's like Dimer. Two two identical subunits. Heterodimer. Yeah, they'll use like those types of prefixes. Oh, okay. I did not know that. All right. I understood. Yeah. So like hemoglobin, for instance, is a uh, is a yeah, uh, homo, or it's a, a tetramer, with like two alpha ones, two beta ones. I went over a passage uh, the other day or yesterday that talked about. Um, an omega subunit, but yeah, anyway, 
I was looking for words that meant it doesn't have more than one subunit, and I saw a single polypeptide, and mm-hmm. I just wanted to verify that that was the hint that they give you. Okay. But, this is another yeah. passage one involving math. I... Yep. So let's see. So, reaction quotient. Do you so remember what that was? Does that mean delta G? Uh, delta so it's kind of like, so you remember like capital K? That's Kevin, right? Oh yeah, no, I mean like, uh, like in a law of mass action, like where you have like the products, like concentration oh, with uh, the exponent, which is the coefficient for that. Yeah, products over reactant. Yeah, yeah. So that's okay. like, that's for, you know, for if it's a K, capital K, it's like an equilibrium thing. But mm-hmm. when it, if it's not at equilibrium, it's capital Q. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's going to be the thing, and then it'll go to the equilibrium. So, basically, for that reaction one... So, so I see reaction quotient, I think of the Q, and then, you know, they say okay. conversion of glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, so I'm going to go right to reaction one. I'm gonna like, my eyes go straight to that. Okay. Oh my so my eyes go straight to reaction one. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I have, you know, the information. And then they say it's 1 E neg 3. So I can just write, you know, that that out. But they also give me delta, delta G, like standard, whatever Gibbs. Uh, yeah, is it negative 16.7? Wait, what's that? Oh, the delta G thing? Hmm? Yeah. Okay. So the equation, is this one delta G NRT? Wait, uh, oh, wait, you're talking about... Wait, what was that? That's the, uh... It's not the Nernst equation, is it? I have no clue. I mean, because if it says glucose is 10, I have, I have no clue. Yeah, I just know RT usually goes together, and the one that I know is delta G equals NRT. Yeah. But um, no. Yeah, we could use that. What is that in physics? That's something else in physics, like thermodynamics. Yeah. Uh, what? But uh, that, that particular equation? Mm-hmm. I think it's the... Wait, hold on. Nernst equation. Let's see. This is... Oh, uh, yeah, I have no clue. This is basically the explanation. And I think I was wrong with my logic. Wait. Oh, it's R, T, L, and Q. Oh, it's that one. Yeah, so, yeah, I just looked it up and it's... There's like a... There's whatever. There's like another way of writing it where... It, they convert it into log, but anyway, so so basically, like they give you the standard Gibbs free energy, and that so that's that value that they give you with the six point negative six point sixteen point seven. So okay, so this is the standard. Yeah. Oh, okay. And to find like the Gibbs for like a particular non-standard condition, mm-hmm. then we would use then we would uh use what you said. The, uh, and delta G is the not. Delta G not is the non-standard. Mm-hmm. And so the reaction quotient equation is, uh, looks like delta G equals delta G not plus R T, you know, L and Q. Yeah. I have not seen this on the actual MCAT, even AMCAT ones. Like I don't know. Oh yeah, that's what I mean about the the Kaplan okay. one being like testing a lot of minutia. But okay. it's always good to to do some logarithms. Yeah, I need this for math though because again, mm-hmm. my math is pretty bad without a calculator. So, yeah. so how would you break break this down? So we have delta G. So it's sixteen. High definition. It's sixteen negative sixteen point seven kilojoules per mole. It's equal to. Um, we, we don't have delta, so what is this 1 times 10 to the negative 3 number? What is that really? Oh, the reaction quotient, so Q, capital Q. So that's Q, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. 
So we're going. So yeah. So we're basically going to like we need to find the natural log of that. And so number is eight point three one four moles per Kelvin, and then temperature. Uh, what should I say? Is it at STP? <laughs> I'm not giving a lot. Wait. Oh. Oh. So uh, normal physics. So like STP is like zero Kelvin, but uh, normal whatever physiological conditions would be. I suppose it'll be your body temperature, right? Oh, that's ridiculous. Either that or room temperature. It says. Three. Yeah, temperature of the human body. Oh my gosh, that is. Okay, so <laughs> I'm assuming that if they don't, so STP would be for physics. Um, oh no, for... S STP is the same, no matter where you go. It's you okay. know like zero. It's yeah zero. But Cal when I'm yeah. dealing with biology, or just I'm supposed to, unless they give me a temperature, I'm supposed to assume it's three ten. Wait, no, no, no. So that's just the temperature of the human body because this is reaction is happening in the mm -hmm. human body. Mm. but they can but usually examples i have i see involve like room temperature which is oh, 25 c or 298 C, which is kelvin 298 kelvin yeah and okay. you know body temperature like uh body temperature is 98 fahrenheit yes but i haven't seen fahrenheit in a while yeah so they're they're going to make you so this question is going to make you like convert that into uh Celsius and then I suppose you can convert it to Kelvin after. Um yes. So like why does it have me adding two seventy three plus thirty seven? I don't know. I'll just remember that three ten Kelvin is human temperature. And then um the oh, reaction code that's oh yeah, sorry. The reaction quotient is one e to negative three. Yeah. Okay. So something to know here is how to convert from natural log to re like base 10 log. Yes. I don't know how to do that. Yeah. So yeah, it basically, without going too much into it, like y y little e, Euler's number. Mm -hmm. So that's where like the 2.3 comes in. Um, so, say that again? Oh, uh, uh, little, little e, like, or, mm -hmm. cause the base of the natural log is, is Euler's e. number. Yeah, yeah. So, I would turn this into e to the one times, no. Oh, so I would just turn this from ln to log, right? Yep. But I would have to add 2.3. And 2.3 is from the E? Kinda, yeah. Okay, so I'm assuming every time I see Ellen, I wanna turn it into log and it'll be 2.3 log or whatever. Yeah, I yeah, I would uh yeah, memorize that a uh, conversion factor. Mm-hmm. 8.314 just for mole Kelvin times 310 Kelvin and then 2.3 log of one e negative three okay and i should do ln is equal to 2.3 log of x ln x okay and then so logs yeah so so yeah i'll send you like the thing of like the logs to remember Mm -hmm. But basically, you just need to know log log of one, log of like log of two, log of three, log of five, log of seven. With that, you can solve for any log. Okay. But yeah, I like I haven't seen the L like the natural log come up on the other material, but since it comes up here, know that that two point three part. Mhm. Mm so. Uh, wait, all right, yeah, so, so yeah, basically that, so, so basically, you know, that, uh, delta G then is going to be negative 16.7 kilojoules per mole, uh, plus 
um, I'll plug in like 8.3, 1.4, whatever. Since that's in joules, and we're dealing with uh, a delta G, like standard delta G, that's mm -hmm. in kilojoules, I'm going to, you know, make that, make 8.314, like I'm going to move the decimal point over. Or I can just write E3 after. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, wait, sorry, sorry. I'm, making, I'm converting from joules to kilojoules, so E neg 3. So and 8 point... The delta G is standard, correct? What's up? Delta G is standard. Uh, yeah, the delta G with that circle, that, like, degree symbol, oh, is the delta standard G. one. Okay. Yeah, so... But yeah, I'm taking the R and I'm making it, you know, E negative three, and then kilojoules mm -hmm. divided by moles times Kelvin. Mm -hmm. And then multiplying it by, so the thirty seven, so the the thirty seven Kelvin thing is just um, uh, basically they're adding, like. That, that amount is just uh, to get the 98 whatever degrees Fahrenheit thing mm -hmm. for the human body. So I'm going to multiply it by the 310 Kelvin times the 2.3 times the log of 1 E neg 3. Right? Yes, okay. I have that. And then log of 1 e neg 3 is just going to be neg 3. And that's because... Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, well, it'll be basically log of 1, which is 0, plus log of 10 to the negative 3 power. And log is really just the inverse of an exponent. Mm -hmm. So, you know... The exponent is negative three, so that's just, you know, it's going to be that. Okay, it looks, okay, so why do they keep this then? Where is that? Uh, let's see. Oh, that's just, that's, that's to make it into the kilojoules. Okay. So, I already did that with... 8.314 e uh, e3 okay. so that's them oh sorry e negative 3 so that's mm -hmm. them uh doing it at the end to because okay. because to, to get to, to make the 8.314 in kilojoules mm -hmm. yeah okay that makes sense Three ten. It'll be two point three times negative three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because this would be technically a lot of math for the MCAT, right? Um. Well, well yeah, honestly, because because you know the first thing you have to do is like. Because the 37 Kelvin part, like, you have to basically first take 98 degrees Fahrenheit and convert it into Celsius and then add it into, uh, add it to the 273 to get, uh, the Kelvin amount. Mm -hmm. So that's where, the, like, the 273 comes from. Like, if you get something, like, in Celsius, you add it mm -hmm. to 273, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's definitely so that that's going to take a couple of uh, steps, and then the uh, converting the natural log to a regular log is going to take some steps as well. Normally, I don't see anything this intensive though. Yeah, I I agree. Mm. This is okay. This is another like recessive type of genetics. This is 49. We could pull it up. Let's see. Oh, too much. There we go. 
Oh, uh, let's see. So, assuming that the locus for PKU obeys... Wait, I wanted to ask you. So, do you remember how to convert from Fahrenheit and Celsius? Um, no. I don't do Celsius to Kelvin. Because I haven't dealt with Fahrenheit for a while. Is okay. It like 30, I don't remember. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So, it's like... A, I think the official formula is like 9 over 5 mm. times whatever it is in Fahrenheit plus 33, I think. Mm. So 9 over 5 is just basically a little bit less than 1 half. Mm. So normally what I would do is, like if it's Celsius to Fahrenheit, is mm -hmm. uh, to... um. Oh wait, so that's that's sorry, that's uh Fahrenheit. So nine over five times whatever it is in Fahrenheit plus thirty-three. Mm -hmm. So I would just like cut it in half and add thirty. Okay. Yeah. So anyway. Let's see, assuming that the locus for PKU obeys the Hardy... Okay, so Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, right? Uh, that is... Is he saying... Is Hardy-Weinberg the one with, uh, uh... P and Q? Oh, he was the one who had the whole thing about, like, the, the genes with, within, like, a environment. Not environment. Yeah, with, like, those, those assumptions, basically. Yeah. Like, him. without, you know, without any, uh, with, yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, okay, so there's, so, okay, what can, what else can you tell me about that with, like, P and Q and stuff? I know he had a whole bunch of, he, he had two equations mm -hmm. in P and Q, and they had some subscripts and... Super, uh, superscripts? Superscripts, yep. Okay, so... All right, so basically, so all right, uh, so basically, there's p plus q is equal to one. Okay, so Hardy Weinberg. Mhm. Mm oh no. Okay, p plus q is equal to one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that one is basically. So p is basically the frequency of the dominant allele in that population. Mm -hmm. And Q is the frequency of the recessive allele. Mm -hmm. All right. And th that's just for an allele, right? But mm -hmm. people have two alleles, right? So, oh, yes. so that's where the other one comes in, which is just a binomial expansion, basically. Mm -hmm. Basically, you're squaring that term. Plus so you get... What's up? P squared plus P squared. So p squared plus two p q mm. plus q squared equals, equals, equals one. one. Yeah. So p squared in that term is mm -hmm. ha, is a homozygous dominant. Homo dominant, and then p q is hetero. Yeah. So the two p q. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the heterozygous. And then a homo recessive. Yep. And you said this equation is used for, uh, I don't say humans, just to make it not humans, but what specifically? Oh, just organisms within a popu like population that obey no, no, like no, oh yeah like p p squared like because you said p plus q is for one allele right? Oh yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, yeah it, but like p squared is just uh, frequency of the population that has that has the homozygous uh, dominant, like, genotype. So I guess this one is for multiple alleles? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Multiple alleles. So here, assuming that the locus, and a locus means an allele? Oh, a locus is just, it's an area on a chromosome that okay. will have, like, a gene of interest. Okay. So, like... PKU is like phenyl keto urea or whatever, <laughs> whatever like the, however you you pronounce it. 
phenol keto something like that like that disease essentially right and so the locus is the is the location on the chromosome where the genes for that like exist okay so like essentially like location of that gene so if that gene obeys the hardy weinberg equilibrium what's mm -hmm. the frequency of the recessive allele that causes it so, so with hardy weinberg the first thing is knowing which equation to use and because it says recessive allele oh well that's for both well, how do we know? Um, okay, so, so yeah, when I, like, so the, it's just talking about, well, okay, how many alleles is it, is it talking about? Yeah. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm asking you. Oh, uh, uh, it says, okay, autosomal recessive. Oh, in the question? It looks like it says allele, so it's one. Yep. So which one are we going to use? P plus Q. Yep. Okay. So well, we have this. to solve for Q. So something in the passage is going to tell us what P is. Okay. So, now, yep. Right here, autosomal recessive. To go back to what you told me earlier, this is not sex link. It's just on whatever type of... Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then um, you said in the past, it's just going to tell us what P is. Mm hmm. One in what can tell me? Yep. Yes. What does this mean? Yeah. So it seems like the, you know, it happens like basically. All right, so if it's autosomal recessive, right, that means that mm -hmm. in order to actually have the disease, like the phenotype for it. Um, so you need both on small letters. Yeah. So, so, so we're going to get to our answer in a different way here. So one in 10,000, right? Mm -hmm. That Those are the ones you actually have it. So what, like, variable... And you could use both equations here. Is that going to be equal to? Dominant. Wait. Well, if if you if you so if you have the condition right, you need to have. You have both of them. Mm hmm. So which mm -hmm. one is yeah? So which one like is it going to be p p squared two p q q squared? Oh, so we have to use the other one. Mm hmm. Though. So even in saying one allele, we have to use the multiple alleles equation? Yeah. Because cause they're saying that the disease occurs in one in 10,000, like, live births. Mm -hmm. So that means that, like, the disease, like, they, they have to be, those are the people who, who are, you know, reset, who are mm -hmm. homozygous recessive, right? Okay. So this is the Q squared yep. number. Yep. So that's ba so basically one divided by ten thousand, which is basically one e negative four, I believe. One, two, three, four. Yeah. That's equal to q squared, right? Yes. So to get q, what do we do? Well, we we are missing two other variables. Do we need them though? You can square root it. You can yep. square root it. That's what you do. So that would be 1 e negative 4 root of that, hold on, is 1 e negative 4 divided by 2. Yep. Which is 1 e, see the negative 2? Yep. That's 1%, right? I oh, think it is. Yep. That's too much. Is this <laughs> common? Because this is... Uh, it's deflating if this is, like, common on the MCAT. I, 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 I think this is a... I like this question because it <laughs> makes us get the answer without... Because that's a thing that people always... 
people who who emphasize like memorizing equations and stuff yeah. but don't like understand like the principle are going mm-hmm. to be like spending so much time on this question because they're going to be like what's p <laughs> but oh, yes. but but you know since we were able to like determine that that number one in ten thousand is uh q squared mm-hmm. you know you 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 set it yourself you just square root it Okay. I mean, I just guessed because I saw like this and I was like, that looks small. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, okay. Ah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Pedigrees are, are always pretty tricky. So. I suffer with these two. Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay. Let's see. If the pedigree below shows the inheritance of hereditary ALS, okay? So I'm gonna look at how it's in, so it says dominant, whatever, missense mutation, so we don't need to know the missense one, but okay. it's dominant, Wait. yeah? Missense mutation. Oh yeah. Okay, now, we, we threw something in, now, in there. Oh yeah. I know missense is on its own, but when you put it into genes, I get a little confused. When it, well, hereditary, I get a little confused with what that means with genes. Oh yeah, that's why I said that part doesn't matter in terms of hereditary, because because okay. we know that it's dominant, which means that we know what. That everybody's gonna have a missing mutation though. Oh no no so dominant is what we're concerned with now because it deals with how it's passed down. Missense is just a detail that they may ask you about. If they want you to to know how, like what form this mutation oh, is, okay, okay. So but, it's a dominant mutation and it's a missense type of mutation. Okay. Yeah. So that's why I was like, we don't need to know the missense part now, because okay. dominant is what tells us like what does that tell us basically? It tells us it's capital letters. Well, what if it's heterozygous? Well, the capital letter proceeds because it's yep. So, so dominant tells us that we're going to count, like, the heterozygous oh, ones. Okay. They're going to be affected. Recessive means that they're not. Recessive means that it's only homo. Yeah. Okay. So, that's why I was like, because they're just showing us, like, the form, you know, a pedigree chart, how it goes from one individual to a next. So, we're assuming that everyone who's in black has the disease, correct? Oh, yeah, yeah. So okay. the question is whether that's just homozygous recessive. Yeah, so that's why the dominant part is what we need. The missense, we don't need to know to answer this question. But that's but, just, yeah. But even so, that means mm-hmm. that the black, the black circle and the black square are both heterodominant. They could be homozygous, though. Well, they can't perform, have a white child if they're... Oh, no, like, since it's dominant, they could either be capital A, capital A, or capital A, lowercase a. Right. But both of them would have to be hetero, because if one was hetero and one was homo, then they would have only black kids. Uh, wait. So, so, uh... So, okay, the thing is that, like, the phenotype, which is black, Mm -hmm. can be either capital A, capital A, or capital A, little a. But the parents, like, I'm saying, like, because it's white, it means he doesn't have it. He or she doesn't have it. Oh, so so if it's white, then it would have to be little a, little a. Wait, okay, wait, you just threw me. Yeah, yeah. I thought black means you have the disease. Yeah, but... The disease is the phenotype. Since it's dominant, it can have a genotype of being either capital A, capital A, or capital A, little a, right? Oh, so if you're white, you're homo-recessive. Yeah. Okay. So that means that it's not going to be as simple as just knowing, like, if it was, that's why, like, you know, I focus on the dominant part because if it was recessive it would be a lot simpler 
because recessive would mean that the phenotype gives you like can be caused by only one genotype but since it's dominant, it can be caused by two genotypes. So So we have to do some extra work. Yeah. Let me just solve it because I'm still like trying to digest. Yeah. So we don't we're not going to assume that the parents are hetero because their child is white. Wait oh, if it's wait, so wait, so we, we don't we're going yeah we're going to figure we're going to figure it out mm -hmm. basically like anything that's black could either be t could be two genotypes and if it's white it can only be one so we're going right. to like do some i mean like so we're going to do like a step to figure out figure that out okay so uh but before that it says that the gene is located on chromosome 22. Okay. So is this autosomal or sex linked? I have no clue. Well, remember, so sex linked means it has to be on a, the sex chromosome. And remember which one that is. Think of the karyotype. I, well, I know it's XY, but I'm assuming sex linked means 24. I uh, have no clue the number relation. Okay, so like how many chromosomes are in a regular like whatever cell uh, <laughs> i get confused with 24 and 48 or is it 12 and 24 it's one of those three <laughs> which I'm one just... do you think though uh i'm gonna say 24 because 24 and me that's what i'm gonna say oh well it's actually 23 and me <laughs> yeah so 23 and me which means 24 together yes no uh is it 23 Yep. Is it not 24? It's 23. So, wait, wait, 23 wait, wait, in a sex chromosome, 46 in a regular. Okay, you just lost me. Because I thought with haploids, it's 12 or 24. No, so it's 23 for haploid and 46 haploid. for diploid. 23 haploid, which is sex chromosomes, correct? Mm-hmm. And then 20, you said what for diploid? Oh, 46? 46. 46 for a diploid. Which is what type? Just regular? Yeah, like diploid, like regular cell, right? Mm-hmm. And then these are sex cells. Yeah. Okay, cool. So this, you said it says 22. So we're talking about... Well, I still don't know who we're talking about. Oh, okay. So you know like a carrier type, When I what I mean when I say that? Nope. Oh, like, all right. So like... Do a Google image search for karyotype. Karyotype. Yeah, K-A-R-Y type. Yes. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, different looking chromosomes. Yep. Or, yeah. Yeah, so okay. this is a karyotype, right? Oh, so 23 yep. is your sex cell, well, sex chromosome, yes? Uh, yeah. Okay, so this, so we're talking about haploid, so, okay, hmm, how do I explain this? So, oh, so basically, yeah, so basically, the, that 23rd one is the sex chromosome, so everything right. else is not that. So, if it's on the 22nd chromosome. Oh, mm -hmm. okay, so it doesn't, I don't want to say it doesn't matter, but if it's set on chromosome twenty. Um, the chromosome 32. If we if we had 24, <laughs> if we had 48 chromosomes, then yes. Mm -hmm. If it's on 22, it wouldn't matter. But it's good to know that <laughs> the 23 and 46 part, though. There's no 48 chromosomes, right? <laughs> no. Okay. There's a Tool From song called 46 and 2, but that's the closest stretch that I can think of. <laughs> But what I'm saying is, is that they only made sure to bring up, like, I'm just trying to figure out the purpose. They made sure to bring up, it's on chromosome 22, just yeah. to let me know that I'm thinking of a haploid cell, and it's not on the sex chromosome. Yeah, but, uh, but it's, it's, like, cause because, all, like, in the karyotype, only... each one had two, so that's a regular cell, so there's actually 46 there, but... Just, just think about it like this. So, 
the 23rd chromosome is the sex chromosome. But that only applies to sex cells because with 46 diploids, it don't have a gen- it doesn't have a gender, right? So the 23rd one mm-hmm. in the char- so in the karyotype you have 23, right? But they're all they all have two whatever chromatids, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So so basically, I guess what I'm yeah. To say is like 23 regardless of how. Okay, here's what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. 23 regardless means sex cell, regardless if you're talking of a haploid or a diploid. Is that what you're trying to say? Oh, yes. That's the position, yeah. So that's why that's... in the carrier type you have two mm-hmm. for each. Because I thought that if we were talking about diploids, since they don't pertain to sex, it wouldn't matter about 23. But I'm assuming that diploid or haploid, the 23 chromosome would be a sex chromosome. Yeah. Because okay. to go from haploid to diploid, diploid or whatever, you don't just get 23 new ones, right? The 23 okay. that you have in the sex chromosome, like, yeah, will replicate, basically. Okay. Like, a karyotype, is- all those, uh, the pictures are from a cell in metaphase. Because mm-hmm. that's in mitosis, you know, metaphase. Because mm-hmm. that's when, that's the only time that you can see them using, like, a regular light microscope. Okay. Because that's when they okay. condense, but yeah. Anyway, so, so since it's on so chromosome 22, it's we know chromosome. that, yeah, good. And, that, and not six, eight. Correct. Okay. And that's, okay. you know, reflected in the pedigree, because you see that it's, you know, evenly distributed with you know, whether you're you're a girl or a boy, you're still going to get the disease. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So right. we have that. And yep. That, that's all I got. All right. So now uh, we're going to make Punnett squares. Oh, no. <laughs> It's, it's like, you know, it's not that bad because, you know, you'll kind of see a pattern pretty quickly. But remember, so we're going to cross. So we're let's start with, you know, a white with a black or whatever. Mm-hmm. And a black could be capital A, capital A, or capital A, little a, right? Yes. And a white will just be little a, little a. Yes. So I'm going to draw two Punnett squares, both cross with little a, little a. But one will be capital A, capital A, and the other one will be capital A, little a, right? All right. Well, yeah, we know that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So is it safe to assume Mm, that kind of makes it difficult because that means that the kids are either all capital A and little a or about three of them are AA, small a's. Um, oh, you mean two? Oh, wait. When, when I cross capital A, capital A, and little a, little a, I get all heterozygous. Yes. Which means that they all have the disease. Mm-hmm. And if when I cross capital A, little a. Oh, sorry. I Yeah, I'm sorry. So oh, that yeah. means that all of them are hetero. Yeah, all of them are hetero. That's what I was getting at. Yep, so all of them are hetero. Oh, it, that's if they, that's if one of the parents are capital A, capital A. But if you cross capital A, little a with little a, little a, you get, yeah. you get half right. with little a, little a, like homozygous, and then mm-hmm. half heterozygous yeah but all the all of their offsprings are black so that means all of them are hetero or just yeah all that means all of them are hetero wait wait so did you cross um capital a little a with little a little a yeah but i'm saying if you're looking at the black Mm -hmm. like oh we did these two crosses to represent the parents like Mm -hmm. the first generation yeah. The second position is all black, which means no one has little A's. 
Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, you already skipped a step, so. Cause, oh, cause, cause, yeah, because basically, yeah, if it was, if one of the parents was heterozygous, you would get 50 with the disease, like 50%, mm -hmm. and then 50% mm -hmm. without it, right? Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, so, wait. So that means that the original parent that's black is mm -hmm. homozygous uh, dominant, right? Uh, which one? Oh, so anyway, you, you you did it right. Yeah, like the, the first yeah, generation. Yeah. yeah, so the second generation is going to be all heterozygous, right? Yes. Good, okay. So you already, like, know that. Okay, good. So we basically know that the... Okay, so then, you know, you so can just cross... Those two, AA... With capital A, little A, by by sub mm -hmm. twice. Yep. And and so, okay, that means that yeah, seventy five percent will develop disease. But I just no, that doesn't make sense because why is the child white? The child should be twenty five percent because it came. Oh, it's white. It, oh, it's it's not a, <laughs> it's not white. It's transparent <laughs> i guess because you're asking oh. yeah okay because you're Maybe asking they're... like what color would that be yeah <laughs> oh that's crap okay that's <laughs> okay so okay that's just reading but okay i get it that makes yeah sense. so the key thing there is to know that the parent like you know the original black one could be mm -hmm. either was I guess a, capital A capital A or capital A little A and we determined that so good job okay um, these are just math that I can now solve because you told me how to do that oh wait methylation this is kind of like what I was talking about before with epigenetics mm -hmm. I know methylation I know that if you uh, methylate the DNA it binds tighter to his stone, so... It's oh, like, yeah, yeah. You got it. Yeah, I studied that with some men stuff. Mm -hmm. This... I couldn't pull that out of this, though. Oh, like, let me I see. Know so, concepts, AP... Okay, APML is a type of translocation, fusion of two genes, expression of a hybrid protein, okay. As a result, it can lead to aberrant silencing of DNA expression. All right, so expression, whenever you're dealing with expression, yes. you're dealing with, or I shouldn't say that you're always going to be dealing with epigenetics, but epigenetics is going to affect expression. So a gene can exist without expressing itself. Like if it's silent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. So, okay. So they're saying that um, that two genes get fused together, right? And, you know, when they get fused together, they express some hybrid protein. And that can cause it to be silenced. So let's see with both the hybrid protein product and another protein called that, uh, which of the following is, oh, sorry, bound to DNA. So those things, that n -car or whatever, and that hybrid protein product, they can, they can bind to DNA and cause the silencing of some type of gene, right? Right. Okay. So, when they bind to the DNA to cause silencing, then it can be like, all right, so let's see. Hybrid protein acts similarly to a repressor gene that is inactive until NCOR binds. NCOR cannot be a co-repressor. DNA methylation likely does not play a role. Okay, so if we're talking about something that can silence the expression, right? Methylation could happen, right? Okay. All right, so 
so C is something that could be possible. Mm -hmm. And let's see, increased histone acetylation. That would do the opposite thing, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. at least we're talking about methylation and acetylation. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about repressors and co-repressors. I don't know that. I know a repressor represses a gene. Co-repressor also represses a gene. Like <laughs> it's kind of like uh, like in the lac operon. Okay. Like, do you remember that? It's like uh, yeah. an in. Lac operon is in E. coli. And yeah. it's basically a bunch of genes uh, transcribed together. And when their their repressor binds to them, it prevents expression, I think. Yeah, there's like that. And then there's like a promoter. It's like can be induced or it can be repressed, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay. So generally speaking, we want it to cause methylation. But since that isn't a choice, only the opposite is a choice. We are, we're we're gonna know that it's gonna be A or B, right? Right. Okay, so N B is saying N core cannot be a co repressor. And then in the reading it says that Yeah, it uh, says that it says that the hybrid protein product and N core both bind to DNA and can cause it to cause it to not be expressed cause it to be silenced well it says so so either okay. so mm -hmm. either the hybrid protein or the or n core could be a repressor like if right. if n core is a repressor the hybrid protein product can be a co-repressor so repressor and co-repressor both repressed yeah just like you know okay. you know co whatever the it coenzyme or whatever so so basically like if the hybrid protein product was the repressor n core would be a co-repressor if n core was a repressor the hybrid protein would be the co-repressor right but the thing is like mm -hmm. the answer says the hybrid protein acts similarly to a repressor gene as an inactive until n core binds but I thought to me that was saying that like once in core binds, it doesn't repress anymore. And that doesn't make sense. Unless it's the wording that's like off. Yeah, because cause the wording doesn't say anything like definite. It it doesn't say that N core and hybrid protein product will cause silencing. It just says that it can lead it can lead to silencing but basically what we like if they so it says the hybrid protein acts similarly to a repressor gene if they said n core right and and they say that it's inactive until n core binds if they if you just replace hybrid protein with n core and replace n core with hybrid protein it would still be a valid answer so they both repress yeah they they both like basically like it in these types of questions, like which one is easier to disprove? If you say an absolute uh, statement, mm -hmm. it's 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 easier to disprove, right? Yeah. A A is something that's just saying that um, the hybrid protein is the repressor and N core is the whatever thing, mm -hmm. but it could just be the other way around. From the information we have, it would still be a valid answer, whereas. Mm -hmm. B is saying N core can never be a co repressor. Mm -hmm. Nothing in the question stem kind of says that, yeah. Okay. And then C is the opposite of what we want, and D is the opposite of what we want. So, so a lot of yeah. questions could be answered uh, based on like looking at the statements made in the choices. Okay. Like, we don't sense. even need to know, like, we, like, it's like an extra detail that apparently, like, the hybrid protein represses it, causing silencing, and then n core binds, causing it to be expressed. That's what A is saying, and that's a possibility. Okay. Like, yeah. It was, like, a process of elimination. Yeah, yeah. And just in terms of, like, like in, like if you think about it 
as which one is the hardest to disprove. Yeah. That would make more sense. These were like on campus ones. Oh, cool. This is like this thing that I take zinc <laughs> and magnesium. Mm. They're good. They're cofactors. Cofactor is a inorganic thing. Okay, yes. Pause. Yeah. Cofactor, inorganic, coenzyme, organic. Yeah. But, okay, so you have like, sometimes with enzymatic processes, you have like some gold or something. That's some what? Cofactor. Oh, I saw like maybe some ion, like maybe pl palladium or gold or some ion is from biochem. Is that a cofactor helping the enzyme? Yeah, I mean, well, you're 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 saying like, like yeah, it seems like it. It's inorganic, and what were you, were you saying about it? Like, what what is it doing? I remember sometimes I have like flashbulb memory. Huh? Oh yeah, that's the like, psychosomatic topic. Yeah, some things that I've learned where it's like, I know that there was an enzyme, some enzymatic process. Yeah, and there would be like a floating ion over it. Oh yeah, yeah. They're yeah, there to just assist. So that's a cofactor. Yeah, What's yeah. It? Oh, enzyme like how would i know it's organic like would it be like a or i mean organic molecule molecule sure so like what just like some examples oh um well you know well organic itself means you know just it's carbon hydrogen base okay, okay. but but also like you know if they're like going if they're going to be big you know mm. like a molecule or something because like cofactors if they're inorganic like they're they're going to be like a metal ion or something like that right they're okay. not going to be like a molecule really that makes sense that makes sense okay i just had to get that clarification because i have had questions where i would miss it because i would um, misconstrue one for the other mm -hmm. so cofactor inorganic coenzyme organic okay so yeah. when it comes, I'm just going to give you a debrief, PKA, PH, you know, KSP, all that stuff. I'm really weak in this type of stuff. I should be ashamed. <laughs> it's been a while. Okay. It's been a while with my gen chem. So, 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 so KA or anything after the P, like P, the P thing just means negative log of the concentration of that. So, or, or whatever the thing comes after. So if it's pH, it's negative log of the hyd hydronium ion concentration. Mm -hmm. If it's pKa, it's negative log of the Ka. So P, you said if it's pKa, it's yeah. negative log of the Ka. Mm -hmm. And what, in your math, uh, shortcuts, negative log essentially means... Oh, so yeah, you take the, uh, so you take the, so if it's like, let's say four times 10 to the negative seven power, mm -hmm. it'll be positive seven minus oh, okay. log of four. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Hold on. So example is hydronium concentration is equal to four times 10 to the negative seven. So yeah. my pH would equal, what now? Oh, so it'll equal positive seven. Seven. Minus, minus log of four. How log of four? So why is it not negative seven? Because it's a negative. Because the it's negative log of the H plus concentration. Okay. Now, mm -hmm. how do you? So I'm assuming you're saying when it comes to logs on that Google Drive. I mean, on that OneNote, I would have to memorize like log of one log of five this and a third so i would have to guesstimate wait what wait oh no, you, you don't have to guesstimate you you you'll uh i uh, there's certain logs that you can use that you can use for any of them so what log would you use for this um four so so you would need to know like log of one log of two log of three log of five log mm -hmm. of seven 
and like whatever log of 10 okay like i also like have them equal to uh like sine and cosine which is also something to memorize oh okay so for log of four i would do log of one and log of three i'm assuming oh well it'll be log of two times two okay or two squared okay and so wait do you remember like okay so like just like i said like log is like the inverse of exponent exponent mm -hmm. rules and logarithms will mm -hmm. function in the mm -hmm. same way Mm -hmm. So, like, for instance, let's say x to the a power times x to the b power. Yes, you add. Yes. So, if it's log of 2 times 2, it'll be log of 2 plus log of 2. Mm -hmm. Now, what about x to the a power in parentheses? to the b power that's multiplying yes so if it's log of 2 to the second power mm -hmm. you will multiply those which really just means you bring that 2 to the front you bring like you know kind of like in calculus or whatever like you bring it to the <laughs> like a derivation so it'll be 2 log 2 yeah oh wow 2 log 2 so it's not log four, it's two log two. Mm hmm mm. So for this one, I would turn this into seven minus log two squared, which is equal to seven minus two log two. Mm hmm mm. And then I probably should have already memorized what log two is. Yeah, so I can like, I can give that to you now if you want. Okay. So, or, you know, I'll just put it in the chat. But here, it's going to make sense because I can I connect it to the sine and cosine values. So, and the more things you can connect, the easier it will be to memorize it. Oh, wait, that first one's supposed to be log, not og. Mm. But you see how log of 1 is equal to the sine of 0, which is equal to cosine of 90? Yes. Sure, yes. Mm hmm Okay. Let's see. So I'm going to put this in my thing, and then I'll hide it on the, once it's in the one note. I got a flash card piece. Jeez. Okay. So, for this one then. Mm hmm Um, okay, so let's see. Bicarbonate, you remember that, right? Uh, okay, hold on. Eight. Oh, yeah, Six. and then Henderson Hasselbach. Wait, what's that? HCO3 or H2CO3? Oh, uh, uh, that's, that'll be carbonic acid. And when it loses so HCO3. one, yeah. HCO3, okay. Yeah, I'll be, uh, I'll be right back. I'm just gonna use the bathroom real quick. Okay.
Okay. All right, so. Okay, so. Oh, wait, yeah, so the uh, Henderson Hasselbach equation. Mm hmm. Uh, H. H. A. <coughs> A minus. Oh, it, so it's. So basically. <coughs> so basically, like. I All right, so I could say that you use it for weak acids, but. Technically speaking, use it for every acid, right. but, so okay, basically it's pH is equal to pKa mm -hmm. plus log, in parentheses, um, like conjugate base concentration, so like maybe like capital A minus in, you know, the brackets, mm -hmm. over acid concentration so like h a capital h capital a mm -hmm. in brackets mm -hmm. all right so so okay now for an for a strong acid right it dissociates completely mm -hmm. if something dissociates completely right mm -hmm. wouldn't the acid concentration be e equal to the conjugate base concentration no Wait, why not? Because it's full of acid? Well, if if it if it's a strong acid, right? All of it should you know Go into weak base, is that what you're saying? Yeah, go, like all of it should basically get like all of it should give away, you know, its hydrogen mm -hmm. or proton. Mm hmm so, so yeah. The same amount that dissociated would be the same amount that's weak base present. Uh, oh, like conjugate base, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if that, so if that's the case for strong acids, right? Then HA concentration will be equal to A concentration. Mm -hmm. So if they're equal to each other, that will just be 1, right? Mm -hmm. And log of 1 is? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. So then yes. pH, yes, yeah, so then pH is equal to pKa, right? Yes. So... So yeah, there's that's why there's two ways of explaining that. One, I could just tell you, use Henderson Hasselbach for weak acids. Mm -hmm. But now you know why, because the real thing is that you use it for everything. It's just that strong acids end up being equal to like pH is equal to pKa just because that lo additional log part mm -hmm. goes away. Okay. You you, you you took quantum mechanics, right? So PCM. Yeah. And so remember uh, perturbation theory or perturbation? Mm -hmm. So wait, uh, when you did like the quantum part in PCM? Mm -hmm. So it's like that word. You got a formula for that? <laughs> so it's just like the, it's when, all right, so so you start off with like the hydrogen atom, right? Mm -hmm. And you can express that as like a harmonic oscillator, right? Mm -hmm. And then for anything else, you add things to that formula. Whatever the formula is, you add things to adjust, right? Okay. That's like the theory behind it, like the perturbation theory. It's like, we know this, we're going to model it as such, and we're going to mm -hmm. add things to adjust it. So that's just like a kind of way, abstract way of like seeing like not a specific formula, but any type of mathematical model. Mm -hmm. So, so basically like pKa is the best measurement of an acid strength pH is just what happens to be how the acid reacts in water. pH is based on, you know, the auto-ionization of water. Okay. Cause, cause... Yeah, yeah, because pH plus pOH is equal to mm -hmm. water. Yeah. So, like, you know, when they first teach you about acids, like, with a pH, it just has to be less than 7 or whatever. That's, mm -hmm. like, most strong acids have a pH of, like, negative something. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's... 
yeah. Anyway, that's just, you know, because I, I don't like to just say, just use this equation for weak acids. Like, if you know, like, why, you have a much richer understanding. It's like, in psychology, like, elaborate re re rehearsal, rehearsal mm -hmm. versus maintenance rehearsal. <laughs> so, like, main, yeah, anyway. I don't know, isn't it elaborate when you, one of them you say something over and over again. Yeah, that's maintenance rehearsal. Okay. That's how most people do it. That would be if I just told you, use Anderson Hasselbach for weak acids. But okay. elaborative rehearsal, you get a much richer understanding of it, and it's yeah. much better. And a bicarbonate is a weak acid. It's... Oh, like carb carbonic acid? No, I don't, I don't know. I mean, bicarbonate. Oh, yeah, or, yeah, so carbonic acid, is that weak? Yeah, it's a, it's a weak uh, diprotic acid. So bicarbonate is both a conjugate acid and a weaker acid. But mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's, uh, it comes into play in, in our blood, like with yeah, carbon with dioxide. Wait, what's up? With the buffer system? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and buffers are basically weak, like, you know, like a weak acid or weak base. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So, patient has bicarbonate levels of that. Blood has a pH of that. What is the level of carbonic acid? All right. So, you have the pH. You have the pKa. You have the, you know, conjugate uh, base concentration. 7.4 is equal to 6.5. So, then, let's look at it this way. Okay. So, so pKa plus log of something, right? pKa plus log of something, yeah. So, um, so I didn't add this to uh, the chat, but what if you take a log of something that's less than one? Um, well, it's still zero because log of one is zero. Wait, I'm getting it confused. <laughs> oh, if you basically have, like, log of 1 over 2. Log of 1 half? Okay, hold on. Log, let me see this. Log of 1 is 0. So if it's less than 1, it's still 0, no? Well, well uh, so, okay. Log of 0 0.5, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. That's log of 1 over 2. Yes. Well, would it be negative then? Because it'll be based on, you know, the exponent rules. When you divide something, you subtract, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So it'll be log of 1 minus log of 2, right? Uh, okay. So it'll be negative 0 0.3. Mm -hmm. So basically, if the, that log term... So since we're adding it, right? So basically think of it like this. pKa is how the acid naturally behaves. And based on that log term, its pH is gonna either go up or down. Okay. So if the, so they're saying that the pH, so the pKa is 6.3 and the pH mm -hmm. is 7.4. So it goes up, right? Which means yeah. that you would have to have Less. Yes. Of that acid. You see it now, right? Yes. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Mm. Okay. Yep. Well, so that's just, you know. Yeah. Okay. Instead of just plugging and chugging and spending, like, so much time on this, you can see that entire equation as, as you know, as, like, this kind of system. So... Again, pKa is how the acid behaves naturally, I guess. Yeah, I would I would say it's a innate kind of uh, you know, it's a measure of like an innate quality of uh, of, of something. Now you know, unfortunately, we have two choices that are high and whatever, and then two choices that are low. So we're gonna have to do some additional stuff, but. That oh, kind of gets, gives you a good idea. That it's, you get rid of C and D at fours. Yeah, yeah. 
So that's that's something that you can do just from looking at it. So and water. Mm -hmm. okay. And then the log portion increases or decreases pH. Okay. So now we know that it's not C or D, and so now we have to do some math. Mm -hmm. So I have 7.4 is equal to 6.3 plus log of, um, oh wait, dang. We have to do some Avogadro, Wait, wait, what about Avogadro? Oh shoot, this is concentration. I'm mm -hmm. tripping. So millimoles over liter is so no, since since they already cold. gave us bicarbonate concentration and millimoles per liter, we can just mm -hmm. leave it. Okay. Oh yeah, because it's all the same. Mm -hmm. So it's twenty two over x, and this is where the math stuff comes in again. So would it be log of twenty two minus log of x? Uh. Wait, wait, wait. So all right, first I would subtract the 6.3 on both sides to get 1.1. Okay. 1. okay. 1.1 is equal to log of 22 over x. So would it be log of 22? I'm just trying to reverse. Yeah, oh, uh, yeah. Log of 22 minus log of x, I suppose. 1.1 1. 1 is equal to log of 22 minus log of x. And so now I divide 1.1 1 .1 by log of 22, and... Uh, so let's do the log of 22. The log of 22... So this is a good good chance for you to use the stuff that I wrote to figure out log of 22. Would I do log of 10... Plus log of 10 plus log of 2. Yeah. What? Because okay. log of 22 is log of 2 times... Wait, wait. 22? Mm -hmm. That would give you uh, 20, I guess. Mm. Yeah. Should I turn it... Is, can I turn it into an exponent or no? Uh, we could do... We could turn it into a... Uh, 21 then you could do uh 21 is equal to 7 times 3 why are we how, how are we doing that wait what's up how are we turning 22 into 21 oh just uh to make the numbers easier oh because the estimating you don't matter okay the estimating Point 1 is equal to log of 21 minus log of x and then log of 21 would be, you said 3 times 7? Yeah. So log of 3 plus log of 7? Yeah. Okay. So that seems like it's going to be like 1.4. Wait, damn it, hold on. If it's 1.4 and we subtract that, that's going to be a negative number. That can't be it. Hmm. All right, I, I have to see something. So 1.75 is like 1 and 3 quarters. 2.2 2 is 2 and a fifth. There has to be an easier way for this to be done. Now I'm going to attack one point. What was this question? 1.75. Wait, what's up? Oh, no, I was going to go to their explanation. Mm -hmm. It sucks because like 7.4 and 6.3 are so close. If it was 6.4, then they would have to be, then then it would be 10 times as much. What is this? Okay, let's see. 1.1, 10 to the, oh yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, so I, I, there's one other thing. So like basically 10 to the power of basically here i'll just send it to you mm -hmm. like this thing um so yeah, uh see. yeah so that's for negative log the h plus thing but basically uh like 
um, the base is equal to 10 to the power of the of the other thing. So 1.1. Which is the uh, pH. Yeah, yeah. So that's for negative log, but if it was like, whatever, like P, K, A, or wait, sorry. K, A is equal to... So yeah, we're basically, so like to get rid of the log on both sides, essentially, like log, let's see, log of A over B, well, why am I doing A over B? Basically, so you see how they go from log of bicarbonate over carbonic acid is equal to 1.1. Mm -hmm. 10 to the power of the log erases the log because it's the inverse of the log. So we would be doing. So yeah, so they're basically. Oh, then yeah. The power of the one point one would be equal to just twenty two over x. Uh, it'll be over. It'll be equal to twenty two. Uh, the bicarbonate concentration of the carbonic acid concentration. So uh, basically, if you take ten to the power of the log of something, mm -hmm. it erases that log. No. Yeah, I understand that. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So be 10 to the power of 1.1 is equal to 10 to the log of the of the 22 mm -hmm. x take out the log and the 10 and so yep. it'll, it'll be 10 to the 1.1 is equal to 22 over x no? yes okay and then 10 to the 1.1 uh, it's that. like they said it's like a little more than 10 so oh. divide the bicarbonate level by a little more than 10. I was like, that's what I was like leaning towards. Oh, you know what? All right, it makes sense. I should have done that then. X equals 2.2. Yeah. So All right. Makes me choose B. No, so, so basically, like, all right. So the first thing I noticed was how 7.4 and 6.3 are basically different by one. Okay. Like when we subtracted it, if we just set it equal to, if we made carbonic pKa uh, 6.4 and we do that first step where you subtract the pKa, mm -hmm. you'd get one is equal to the log of uh, bicarbonate over carbonic acid. Mm -hmm. And if it's equal to one, then that log of that ratio would have, would be equal to, would be the log of 10, right? Log of 10 is equal to one. So yes. basically, like, bicarbonate would be two times, uh, sorry, ten times that of the carbonic acid. So I was looking at, like, so that would make it, like, ten, uh, sorry, it would make it, like, 2.2, 2, right? Yeah, I, I have that. That's my answer right now. Yes, and 2.76 is greater than that. So you should go lesser. Yeah, we have to go less because... Um, instead of, uh, so, so the example I gave you is 10 times as much, but our answer is greater than 10 times as much. It's a little bit higher than 10 times as much. So it should be a little less than 2.2. .2. Okay. I should have, I should have looked at it that way first because that 2.76, I didn't pay attention to the seven, the 0.76 at first because that's greater mm -hmm. And it should be a little less than that. Okay. But from this, I got that Houston Hasselbach. I got to memorize this equation. And conceptually, you know, if it was a strong acid, pH equal to pH, but we use the weak acids, and then the log is what changes it to go up and down. Now, if this one had like a greater difference between these, it would probably have been easier, you know. But then I would have known oh small number because of the law situation going on. But because A and B didn't have that much of a difference, we had to do math. Yeah. The the thing that yeah, the thing that I pretty much noticed first is just how the PKA and the pH are the difference between the two is so close to one. Because that makes that log term like so much easier. 
So is there any way you would change it to make it easier? Oh, yeah. I, I would just, like, make that the PKA a little higher, like 6.4. Uh-huh. If it was 6.4, then we would know that bicarbonate concentration is 10 times that of carbonic acid concentration. Um, okay. And since it's a little bit lower, that means it has to be a little bit higher than 10 times. Okay. Makes sense. So, that's, so the first thing lets us cancel out C and D. And the second part, like, we would have to see if it's, like, more than 10 times or less than 10 times. And it's a little bit more so. But anyway, we learned, we did a lot, you learned a lot about logs and stuff in that, in that question. Swimming. This is, I wonder if it talks about point for it. Okay, so. Work done by gravity, 75 kilogram swimmer. Mm, okay. So, so, okay, work energy theorem. So, like, what energy is defined as the ability to do work? Yes. So, you treat them as the same, essentially. Okay. And what's, you know, the formula for work? Well, it's that. But I guess in, you got, hmm. If you don't remember the formula, you could look at the units. And if you don't remember the units, you could look at the formula. <laughs> well, with this one, I'm going to go with... This isn't a work equals force distance plus sine data. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, pretty much. So, like, force is newtons, distance is... Uh, meters so newtons times meters is the same thing as a joule okay it's the gravity that throws me off because this makes me want to think of kinetic energy like uh energy equals uh change delta ke equals well ke t t t equals t wait what wait what like this makes me want to think of you know kinetic energy and potential energy Oh, wait, what about what about that, though? It's because if, if, I, I see gravity. When they talk about gravity, I automatically think of potential energy because of MGH. Um, well, gravity, okay. Because, like, work, yeah, I want to say FD goes on data, but, like, they gave me gravity and mass. All right, so... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, like, a, a big trick here. So, work, people usually forget the cosine theta part. Mm -hmm. Now, gravity, right? Mm -hmm. It's, you know, that force is, like, what did, like, what's the angle of that force to, like, the ground or whatever? Well, I wouldn't have to look at this. Well... It's this gravity, the force of gravity is the same. Oh. Yeah. So the force of gravity angles 90 degrees, so zero. Cosine of 90 is zero, right? Mm hmm So the work is zero. What? So I can't use my work equation. Y you can. And you got your answer. What? Oh. Wait. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. In. Okay. If it's perpendicular, it doesn't do work. I just don't. Okay, let me start over. I read the question. In the experiment, blase blase, work done by gravity is 75 kilogram swimmer. He swims and he has his gravity. So I'm like, okay, work equation. Work equals FD cosine theta. Okay? And I guess... What what's the work that the Earth does on the Moon as it orbits us? I have no clue. So I mean, the Moon is moving. Oh, I guess you could say the Moon is perpendicularly moving around the Earth, right? Like well, it's the force. So, like, 
it's mo- it ends up moving in some type of circle, whatever. Yeah. But the force of it, right? Mm-hmm. Is perpendicular to yes. It, to- yeah. So what what's the work that the Earth is doing on the Moon? Zero. Yep. Whoa. So hmm. Hmm. Oh no, I'm trying to like. I just hope this doesn't bite me in the butt. Because like <laughs> you have to. Use- well, just remember, go back to the because it's so force is a vector, and the displacement is the other vector, and so if they're perpendicular, it, yeah. One is when it's parallel to the Earth. Or or anti-parallel, aka 180 degrees going in the opposite direction. That's when work is maximized. So is that the one where, like, oh, this guy's pushing a box up a ramp? What's the work? I I'm oh, going so that'll be work. parallel to the incline. So work is still being done, mm. but only because the guy is pushing it along mm. the incline. Mm. So if something is falling from the sky, gravity is doing no work on it. Correct. Okay. That, that's concepts. If uh, if there's a what about if there's like an electric field? Electric field. And, um, you know, like a mass spectron, like you know, where where you shoot like an electron or whatever, and mm-hmm. one, so like two plates or whatever, right? Electric field between them. This bottom one is positive, top one is negative, and I shoot like an electron here it's Mm -hmm. going to like curve like downwards right towards the positive yes so how much work is the electric field doing on that electron well the work that's causing it to be pulled downward so think about the vectors and stuff Mm -hmm. if it's going straight Yes. And the field, electric field, is going like up, and then there's one down. Well, uh, it's just going from like positive to negative. Oh, oh, so there's no two different fields. This is one field. So if this is negative and this is positive, it's just one field of the positive going to the negative. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Mm-hmm. But it's perpendicular as well. Yes, if it's perpendicular, we have work. Yes. Uh, wait, say that again? Oh, parallel. <laughs> yeah. Parallel network. Oh, jeez. Yep. Okay. If it's parallel. So, the gravity for that one. Wait, so, tell me about the, the, gravity. the electron the gra- and the electric field. So, the electron is just going straight this way. Mm-hmm. And, you know, electric field is going straight this way. That's- Ridiculous. Uh-huh. No work. So the electric field isn't doing any work on the electron. And that's a mass spectrometer. Like, if you have uh, some atom with some mass, like, mm-hmm. it'll, it has less mass, it'll, like, curve more. But, okay. yeah, no work is being done. So for this... A lot of physics questions like that, like, again, that's why I tell students like not to just memorize <laughs> formulas because they're just going to be like uh, they're going to plug things in and stuff but mm-hmm. like knowing like the you know like yeah lots of things in physics will be like zero or like things will cancel out right mm-hmm. like well, I, yeah let's see. let's see I'm going to some physics one see if I can find some oh this is physics. Uh, yeah, I, so I had another student that was using PV equals NRT for volume of blood. And that's like another example of like how just the for- knowing just the formulas are, isn't going to help you. <laughs> because, yeah. But uh, anyway, so let's see. I mean, I'm a, I'm a memorizer, so I'm trying to get out of that. Well, you're, you're, Whatever, you're a chem major, so, you know... You've already, you've already done the, you've already 
you know done that like you you're you know that's like a physical science so mm-hmm. um all right so let's see observe frequency measuring the blood the flow of blood through the vena cava away from all right so is this some doppler stuff i guess <laughs> okay uh let's see what is it okay wait ultrasound okay Fifty. Okay. Uh, wait. Forty. All right. Flow of blood through the vena cava, forty centimeters per second. Typical ultrasound device, around ten megahertz. Speed of sound in water. All right. So. I, so a lot of times we basically treat blood as water. Okay. So that's where the fifteen hundred meters per second comes in. So sound is is faster. In, in solid bridges stuff versus water and air. Yeah, and yeah. it's faster in wa- in fl- in a liquid than in gas, right? Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Air is the least. Yeah, because it requires a medium, but yeah. So, uh, all right, 1,500 meters per second. Mm -hmm. So it's moving away, right? So if it's moving away, all right, so that's where the point, okay, got it. All right, so I guess you subtracted, or no, yeah, you subtracted it, right? I guess. I have no clue what's going on. Oh, okay, okay. So, so basically the uh, speed of sound in water, that's the speed of the medium, is 1500, so that's where the 1500 number comes from. The Uh, flow of blood through the vena cava is 40 centimeters per second, which is 0.4 meters. Oh, wow. So, so that's why it's... we can cross out B because that 1540 comes from thinking that it's 40 meters per second. Mm-hmm. So it's doing the speed. So the Doppler equation for this will be the top portion is the speed. So if something's moving away... That frequency, is it going to go, is it going to be, that observed frequency, is that going to be higher or lower? Lower, that's why I did D. <laughs> um, so, D, if you, you have a smaller number going into a larger number, right? Oh, it's going to be larger frequency. Yeah, right? Because, like, basically this is, like, another thing you can do. Like, you can look at the numbers, like... So all the choices have 10 to the 7th power, so I don't care about that. But since we're multiplying it by something, Mm -hmm. like, so like A basically is going to be something that's going to be a larger number, right? Because of that Mm -hmm. denominator being smaller. B is going to be a smaller number. C is going to be a smaller number. D is going to be a larger number. And it's moving away from you, so it's going to be... Um, a smaller number so basically um, a is out and D is out Mm -hmm. and then between B and C like B is just mistaking it for 40 meters when it's centimeters Mm -hmm. so this is a way for you to answer it like without necessarily knowing like any particular formula just by knowing that it's going to be a lower observed frequency Okay. Okay. Again, yeah, this is not memorizing. This is just... So then, okay, what do you suggest then, like... Let me stop, because I'm getting brain at English. What do you suggest then for, like, understanding physics concepts? Because, like, I just try to memorize equations, but, like... Oh, um, I mean, like, exactly, like, how you've been doing it just now. You're, you're doing it pretty well in terms of like noticing so like uh i guess 
I don't know, I call it like number sense, like just mm-hmm. kind of like having a, a, a feel for the numbers. You're, you're able to do that um, pretty quickly, which is good. Like in that previous question, like, you know, you saw like just, I guess, like kind of like zoom out and look at things on like a macro scale instead of because like with so okay like let's say you know a formula and you don't really know anything if you just memorize it then you just like have it there and then you would think about plugging things in but so like let's use henderson hasselbach as an example it's like Mm -hmm. you know you have it there but if you zoom out you get to see like pka it's like a measure that's innate to the acid and then a log term that you add to it and the ph is a sum of that pka and that log of that ratio you know between the the conjugate base and the conjugate acid so is that ph going to be greater or less and then you can kind of like think about it like that by zooming out um and uh so like for instance like um i had like a student that when so there was like a question about um oh like blood volume Mm -hmm. and that causing a rise in blood pressure Mm -hmm. and um you know the student was thinking of pv equals nrt where pressure and volume are inversely proportional. Mm -hmm. So if you just used, you know, the formula, which could be for a different type of thing, like a gas or an ideal gas, then you would think that if if volume increases, pressure decreases. decreases. So tell me what's the difference there between volume in a gas for the ideal gas equation or formula or whatever, and volume in, you know, for blood. What is it a volume of? Um, well, I know for ideal gas, the volume is less than what? No, for ideal gas, the volume is greater than what's assumed because it's assuming that there's no bonding going on. So, like, what is the volume a measure of in either of these? Oh. Yeah. Oh, um, well, for blood, it's, yes. Physics is not my, okay, hold on. Well, blood. you're basically, you, you did a chem oh, major, area, so. cross-sectional area, and the amount that's in it, maybe? Okay, now, for a yield gas thing, what's that volume? Same thing? So, all right, think about it this way. So when you your diaphragm contracts yes. and your, like, lungs, like, the volume of it increases, causing that pressure to decrease so you can inhale, right? When diaphragm contracts, it goes up. Oh, uh, it goes down. That's a weird thing. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> So diaphragm goes down. Yeah. It means inhaling. And you said what now? Oh, so it goes down so that volume increases? Yeah. So think about that. It's the like volume of what? It's the volume of that or... wait, what's he say? Well, volume container, but yes. for volume okay, container. Now vo- for blood volume it's the volume of well, it would be like the uh, vein or the artery or the... Well, it's the, the volume of the actual blood. Mm. So, like, ideal gas law, volume is the volume of a container. Mm. And if that container gets larger, the pressure decreases because there's less of those malt gas particles like hitting it, right? Yes. And if it pressure, uh, I'm sorry, if volume decreases, that gas, the gas molecules will hit the thing more and you know, whatever, pressure will increase. 
So it's the volume of a container only. For blood, it's the volume of the blood itself. So if there's more of volume of the blood itself, it pushes against the container, which is a blood vessel or whatever, causing more pressure. Oh, so it pertains, hmm, pertains to the quantity of the blood versus the changing of the, the vessel that it's within. Yeah, think about it like, you know, in thermodynamic system and surroundings. Mm -hmm. So like blood, when you do it for blood, you measure the volume of the system. When you do it for an ideal gas, you measure the volume of the surroundings. Mm -hmm. That's why it's 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 an inverse relationship. So like knowing like those nuances is what's going to like make you be able to to answer like anything. And even when it comes to equations and formulas, like you don't have to it's like it's like if you really like understand it you don't even have to memorize it because you understand it. Like you, when you went over Henderson Hasselbach, we went over like how, you know, something, the ratio affects like whether the overall number goes down or up. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, and also for like work, you said like FD cos cosine theta. Mm -hmm. And then you can see that that just essentially means that it's maximized when it's like, parallel or anti-parallel and any type of thing that's a component that's vertical or whatever or closer to gets to vertical it does the opposite so i don't think torque is on the exam anymore but torque is like the opposite that's like fd whatever sine of theta which basically means torque is maximized if it's 90 degrees mm -hmm. like that causes like a rotation mm -hmm. Um, what are like some, I guess, like principles in physics or whatever that you, you may like not understand or have questions on? <laughs> Lenses, optics, mm, sometimes I struggle with kinetic energies. I'm trying to get better at those. Um, let me just look at something. Let me I mean, pretty much everything, honestly. I mean, physics has been a battle. I struggled through physics one and two it, but i don't know it's just weird uh but um lenses optics oh yeah so there's an optics guide that i wrote that i'll share with you but there's like a table that i made that oh yeah so here so in this link there's that mm -hmm. table so, like, that's one of the things that I recommend you do, like, in the beginning of your exam when you have, like, the 14 minutes. Like, you have, like, those, like, for the tutorial and stuff. Mm -hmm. I spend that time, like, writing on my scrap paper, like, things, to, like, to, that I have memorized. So, like, I draw this optics table. Tell me when you, like, have it, have it up. I'm looking at it. Hold on, I'll just... Yeah, so there's that table, so you can have that, yeah, so you can have that memorized, but you can also see, like, a pattern here. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like sine and cosine, and kind of like log and stuff, where they're kind of, like, complementary. Like, for instance, see how that object distance, so, okay, if it's diverging, then it's always going to be SUV, which is smaller, upright, virtual. Okay. But if it's converging, then it's going to it's going to depend on the location of the object. So object distance infinity, it'll be a really small inverted real image. Mm -hmm. And then if it, the object distance is just greater than 2F, which is like whatever radius of curvature, it's going to be a smaller, like bigger than tiny. I couldn't think of like a better word than tiny, but st still smaller inverted real when the object is at the radius of curvature 2f it's going to be same size inverted real mm -hmm. and when it's the object is between the focal length and two times the focal length it's going to be a larger inverted real when it's at the focal length it'll not produce an image mm -hmm. and when it's within the focal length it'll be a larger upright virtual 
So essentially, as the object d distance, as the object gets closer, it's getting s larger. Okay. Until there's no image, and then it's just becomes virtual. But also, you can see like the pattern here, like when object distance is at infinity, image is at the focal length. And when mm -hmm. the, um, sorry, uh, when the image distance is infinity, the object distance is at the focal length. Mm -hmm. Right? And then, mm -hmm. you know, when the object distance is greater than 2f, image distance is between f and 2f. When the object distance is between f and 2f, image distance is greater than 2f. And then they meet at 2f. When object distance is at 2f, image distance is at 2f. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like explain it below. So okay. I say like, you know, converging up. And by the way, like I, I, I stopped the clock at, at 2 hours 30 minutes. So this is like not, you know, charging you for this. Okay. So, so converging optical devices will produce ever increasing inverted real images until the object mm -hmm. is within the focal length, at which point it'll remain large, but now virtual. So I say note the pattern, object distance and image distance are like sine and cosine. Mm -hmm. And, um, oh yeah, then I talk about like a magnifying glass. Like, you know, what you like burn things with a magnifying glass. Yeah. So like that's it's... the object distance is infinity, AKA the sun. And it produces a real image, which means it can be projected. So it's an image of the sun. That's super tiny. It's on that. It's a tiny little point. So that's why it's super concentrated, and can burn things. Okay, that makes then, sense. I'm gonna, I'm gonna download this and read it over. Yeah, and then I talk about the relationship with uh, like glasses. Mm -hmm. Like you're nearsighted, so yeah. your eyeballs longer, mm -hmm. which means that your eyes cause the image that you see to be. Uh, to to basically converge in front of your retina. Mm -hmm. So you need, your glasses are diverging lenses. Yes. So it causes it to di diverge a little bit. So it converges like later. So to just to get it right at your retina. Okay. So like, so like, you know, so this is kind of like, the approach to physics slash anything, which is like, like n note it, like note the pattern, like look for patterns, mm -hmm. and then think about real life examples mm -hmm. to like help you like match it, like you know to gain an intuitive understanding, and then I connect it with your eyes and and lent like eyeglasses to mm -hmm. add that interdisciplinary um, aspect of it because. You know, you don't want to think like you don't want to think like, oh, this is a physics passage. I need to think about physics or this is like whatever biochem passage. I need to think about bio. Think about mm -hmm. like when you think when you're doing a physics passage, think about everything like can make as many like connections as possible. Because okay. like um, I always say like bio is just applied chemistry. Chemistry is applied huh. physics. That's fair. And physics is applied math. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And then if you go in the opposite end of the spectrum, like whatever, you're going to go into like social sciences and then uh, humanities. And then the opposite end of that spectrum is philosophy. Mm. And then I kind of think that they both kind of meet like math and philosophy or like physics and philosophy to kind of meet on opposite ends. And mm -hmm. you can kind of see that because... You know, this test, like, you know, th this test basically, like, why is cars on it? Because. That's true. Because every, like, the test is passage-based. And why is it mm -hmm. passage-based? Because your GPA already reflects what you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the MCAT is designed to test, like, your critical thinking ability like your reasoning ability when presented with a new situation, like yeah. not just what you know and what you can regurgitate, but a passage will talk about something brand new 
and mm-hmm. you know and you know you already know, know like not you don't have to like completely understand the passage because lots of pre-med students like they're very thorough and they work very hard but they treat the passage like a textbook chapter where they like you know they look at it they read it very closely they take notes but mm-hmm. at the bottom of each passage it tells you like it gives you like a citation and they're usually from like research research like papers mm-hmm. so they're like it's on topics that are very like obscure and like esoteric and ultra ultra like out there so you don't have to be an expert on exactly what they're talking about because they're always going to be using like really like crazy you know crazy things the thing that you have to be able to do is um separate like all like look at that a mass of like disorganized information and like organize it in your brain by taking apart like what you need to answer the question Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's what I've been trying to do. I feel like my first time I was big on just learning content and like what you were saying, like trying to understand this and third into applying a lot of strategy. And that's what I'm focusing on more this time, along with making sure I have the content behind it. So I'm, I'm gonna keep working at it. I do want to, for our next session, focus more on like Kimpiz and Psychosocial like Possible. Yeah, of course. Available on, on Sunday. Mm hmm. <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, so, um, I, Jennifer and I, we're reviewing our MCAT at um, 11 on Sunday. So, what time would you be available after 11? Oh, yeah. Usually, like, afternoon or later. I'm not, I'm not an AM person. <laughs> yeah. So, does, like, 5 work for you? Uh, yeah, yeah. We can, like, um, you know, iron out, like, exactly like when uh or like what time or whatever but yeah like five should work um you could send me like uh like questions or passages like uh like screenshots through email and Mm -hmm. like yeah what i usually do is like i will try to answer them in the one note and that that way i can like answer them and it won't take up time and if they don't make sense from that explanation i can go over it in you know in person so Sunday, I should screenshot the one.